All right, so let's move on to the today's material. So today, so so far, we what we did is first week intro, second week basic ML, basic machine learning, and the optimization, the the feature, the curse of dimensionality, overfitting, underfitting, the regularization, all that. So we did that, and then the third week, so the last week, it was from logistic regression to adding a one single hidden layer, and then doing some classification, right, or regression for that matter. So now we're moving on to a a proper neural network model, uh, autoencoder, which is actually a good way to start. So we start with autoencoder this week, and then we're going to build upon this to go to VAE, which is variational autoencoder, next week. And then after that, it'll be GAN and all, so on and so forth. So basically, uh, the reason for the reason that autoencoder is a good, great place to start is that because it has a very simple architecture, it has a symmetric architecture, it has an encoder and decoder, and they usually look the same way. We're going to talk about that. But before we go into that, we're going to talk about latent representation, which is a very important concept. It's, it's very important that you understand what really happens in, latent, in the latent space and how your input data, input samples, are either expanded or compressed in the latent space and how it, you know, how the dimensionality, the adding or taking away dimensionality affects the sample's behavior in the latent space. Then we're going to talk about autoencoder. Training process is, we're, I mean, we've already done a practice session number three with the logistic regression and multi-layer perception. So hopefully we can just uh, speed things up in here. And then some visualization and autoencoder variants, denoising autoencoder and sparse autoencoder, and that's it. So latent representation. So we all, the last, last uh, Tuesday, we used this image as a input, input sample example. So uh, bef I think it was, before it was one, I think it was 120. The example was that given in the context of 128 by 128 resolution, but, and that's why it was 16K last week, but today I think it's going to be a different dimensionality. So let's assume that they are 28 by 28, just like MNIST 28 by 28, then this will be 768, right? So, but the, the actual detail num detailed numbers are not really important. The important thing is that we use four neurons in the single hidden layer that we had in our MLP, in our multilayer perception. And what we did is that each dimension or each neuron was responsible for something. Because when we assume that the activation functions here were all sigmoid, were all sigmoid, then we could assume, we could treat or interpret this single hidden neuron as a logistic regression classifier, right? So there will be one, two, three, four, five logistic regression classifiers. And we assume that in the hidden state, in the hidden layer, the four logistic regression classifiers were responsible for something such as, does it have a long hair? Does the image contain a mustache? Does the image contain a ribbon or makeup? Something like this, something, something useful, useful that will facilitate the last, hit, last logistic regression to correctly classify whether a given sample is a man or a woman, right? So this four-dimensional representation, so the so when I say the representation, we have a activated value here, right? There will be after the after 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 the activation function, there will be a certain value here, 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 here. If you remember the backprop example, the weighted sum, so we can actually if you blow it up. The weighted sum was Z and the activated value was A in the previous backprop example, right? So there will be A1, A2, A3, A4, right? So these four A's, four, so the four-dimensional A's, A1, A2, A3, A4, they are the latent representation of this original image. Original image has six, 768 dimension, and this is four dimension. So what's happened is that the image is compressed into four-dimensional space. And we are assuming that each space probably has some meaning. Something could be interpretable, could, maybe not. No, could be uninterpretable to human mind, but still it, be, it, sh it, should, it should mean something. And that meaning should be something that is helpful, that, that helps the final classifier, which is this one, classify whether the given image is a woman or man or woman, right? So what happens is that we have a four-dimensional, four-dimensional, latent representation of the original image. So, or it could, you could say the hidden representation, latent representation, compressed in, uh, representation. There could be many names, but basically it's 
a it's a it's a representation basically. So any image can be a uh, question. Does the latent representation vector have to refer to the vector right before the final layer? No, actually, good question. Good question. If there were more layers here, if it was if it, if the whole architecture contained three hidden layers, then there will be first layer, first uh, latent representation number one, latent representation number two, latent representation number three, you know, so on and so forth. And each latent representation would behave a little bit differently. So you can think you can easily think of you know multi layer perception with two layers, three layers, four layers, five layers, or even you know ResNet heads like hundred layers, right? So each layer will serve its own purpose, and it will have its own latent space. And uh, all the, the the purpose of all of those latent spaces is eventually to help the final classifier, the final logit, your your logit, being able to correctly correctly do its job, perform its perform its test, whether it's a man or woman classifier, whether it's a one thousand way image net classifier, whatever it is, the, uh, you know the task is given, and the all layers before the final layer is just a way to ease the job or help the help the job of the uh, the job of the neural network to uh, I mean help the neural network to do perform its job correctly all right hope that makes sense all right so in case we're still talking about just one layer uh just neural network with one hidden layer so in this case um each sample will be converted into a different into a four-dimensional four-dimensional vector with different values. For example, this female's image could be converted to 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.4. Ellen Turing could be converted to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Obviously, because if we assume that these four dimensions have some meaning, then depending on the mean, meaning and, and the, depending on the input, the value of the four dimensions would obviously be different, right? So you can assume. Uh, you can assume something like this. So there's an original space of eight. Oh, yeah. Okay. So 784, not 786. Anyway, so the original space, if we assume that the image is coming with the resolution of 28 by 28, then the original space would be 784 dimension. And there could be infinite number, an infinite number of images in this space. So it's a blanji pavilion. It's an infinite set. And what you have on the other hand is a latent space, latent space of four dimensions. So this, this here in, in this space, in, in this space, everything that is 800, 7, 884 dimension is here. Whether it is actually a human image, whether it's a dog image, whether it's a cat image, it doesn't really matter. As long as it's pixel 784 dimension pixel value sample, then it is in this, in this space. And anything that is four dimension with continuous value will be in this space, right? And what what we have is a function. So there's a function f that compresses the given input sample from 784 dimension that maps from the given those maps from that space to the to the four dimensional space. So you can assume that this will be a many to one relationship. I forgot the name of this. It could be I forgot if it's surjective or injective. Forgot the terminology. Okay, we need uh,一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一定一
not really likely because if you think this is a this is a uh, a real valued space, then you know, even if like some images could have a very similar four dimensional output, the actual real the 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 accurate value would be probably different. Like if like this could be this could go to like zero point two one 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 five, and this could go to zero point two one 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 four, something like that. So re, re, in reality, there no, there will never be the exact same uh, same latent representation unless you you know throw away certain number of sub decimal points. But anyway, the gist is that we move from the higher dimensional space to lower dimensional space, and uh, yeah, four dimensional space. If if you assume that it's a four-dimensional space, I'm actually missing one axis here because I can't we can't draw four dimension in our world, right? So uh, we're missing what? We're missing this one. But basically what is what I, what this what I, what what I'm trying to say is that all these compressed latent representation of the original 784 dimensional image lives somewhere here, like here, 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 like anywhere, anywhere. You know, you can uh, imagine the sample. Imagine the the original image, the human face images, living in a four dimensional compressed space. And uh, right, the, pr the question is, would it really consist of four axes? You know, like the long hair, mustache, ribbon, makeup. Probably not, because that was just an example. Like I, I try to specify the role or the the meaning of each dimension, just to help you guys understand what's what's what could be going on. But in, re in reality, it's not as interpret interpretable as this, you know, unless you, you know, unless you try to like analyze the uh, dimensions, it's not really readily interpretable. So by the way, so the important thing is how do we learn this space, you know, because for there's, so we're missing one axis here, like assume, assuming there's like makeup axis, makeup axis. So how did we learn this place? Like, well, how did, meaning that how did we, you know, or arrive at these specific values for each sample, like you know, like uh, like like you know, Ellen Ellen Turing going here, like Ramanujan going here, you know, like some some people Marie Curie going here, Einstein going here. Like how did we how did we decide that certain people or certain pixel values should be compressed into this specific value or this specific value or this specific value? So that was decided by our loss function. What we did is that we the final the the task of our neural network was a man versus woman classifier, right? So given an image, we wanted to classify whether it's a man or a woman. And the latent space is determined by that loss function. So because if you think about the how backprop works, you know, we start from the loss function. And then what we do is we update the update the, the weight parameters of our network in the first layer and the second layer. All those weight parameters, the weights are updated according to the backprop. And the backprop is then their weight, the weights are updated so as to Minimize the minimize the cross entropy error or vice versa. Maximize the log likelihood, right? So all our the per, the entire purpose of the network is to do man versus woman classifier, and the latent space is exactly that. Uh, the latent space is formed or, or defined in a way that maximizes the accuracy or minimizes the loss cross entropy loss of the man versus woman classifier. So I'd like to share a very uh, nice website with you guys so that has this uh animation right here hope you guys can see this so suppose that what we are doing is so this is a, a let's assume that these blue line is a class a, a sample from one class and the this red line is a sample. There are samples from another class. So there's a there are two classes. There are two classes here: blue class and red class. And there are just infinitely many number of samples because it's a line, right? And what we want to do is we want to classify between a red group and a and a blue group. So it's a binary classification. And if you're just using a linear classifier like logistic regression or support vector machine or whatever, then we can't classify this because you know it would look like this. The best what the best way we can the best we can manage with a linear classifier is this. We are going to draw a line horizontally, and then we're going to miss this part, this part, and this part. So this both both ends of both ends there are red 
samples that are on the other side, which is the blue side. And in the middle, there are some blue samples that are on the other side, the red side. So we're making some errors. And this is inherently, innately unconquerable because you know with a linear classifier, there's no way you can 100% accurately classify the, the divide these two lines, right? So what we need to do is we need to add a, a hidden layer like this, so hidden layer. Then what we can do is this. So we can have, with a power, with the help of a hidden layer, we can draw a nonlinear decision boundary. So this is a, this is decision boundary. This is a linear decision boundary, and this is a nonlinear, probably convex decision boundary. So with this kind of decision boundary, we can perfectly, hundred percent, with hundred percent accuracy, we can classify or divide between the blue line and the red line. So that is the power of this hidden layer. Hidden layer helps us achieve a nonlinear task, like perform a nonlinear task. But what really happens, what really happens is that it's not, I mean, on, on, the, on the surface level, it seems like we are drawing a nonlinear decision boundary. But what in reality, what is really happening in the latent space is this, is this. We're still drawing a linear boundary. So if you think about what's happening, so there should be a lin there should be one hidden layer. I mean sorry, there should be a one hidden neuron here because we're doing a linear we're doing a binary classifier, but assuming that there's only one neuron. What's always happening at the final layer is always a linear classifier. Because if you think about this this layer being an being an input new input and this layer being an output, then anything that can be done between this these two layers, anything in anything that can be done in between these two layers. It's always something linear. It could be linear regression, linear classification, whatever. It has to be linear. So if you think about it, what's really happening is we're drawing a line, a linear line, where the input samples have a nonlinear transformation. So because of this layer, this hidden layer, the original space, which would look like this, is now transformed like this, so that a linear classification can be done now. So that's what's happening. You can see that the space being warped and you know, like compressed and warped, not, not really compressed, but warped in a nonlinear way. So we start we started from the two-dimensional space, it's still two-dimensional. So there was no compression, but you can see there's a bit of a warping here. And the warping is the the warping is done thanks to a nonlinear activation function. If there was no linear, there was no activation function used here. If it was just all linear, you know, like just matrix multiplication, then this wouldn't happen. This wouldn't happen. There has to be a nonlinear activation function, be it a sigmoid, 10H, ReLU, doesn't matter. It had, there has to be a nonlinear activation function here in order to make a space deformation, like deform like this. So you can see there's a bit of like a sigmoid like, sigmoid kind of a sigmoid like uh, transformation here, like, like kind of like an S type of thing. You, you can see it's like, uh, like here, like here, you can see here. So you can assume that something similar to sigmoid or 10H, you know, activation function was used in the hidden layer here. Hope that makes sense. Does it, does it make sense? 다 이해 되시죠? 제가 영어로 하는 얘기. 네. 질문 있으시면 아무튼 하셔도 됩니다. 이게 굉장히, 굉장히 중요한 컨셉이래가지고 다 이제 이해를 하셨으면 좋겠습니다. 그러니까 이제 왜, 리, 왜 히든 레이어 써야 되고 왜 액티베이션을, 넌 리니 액티베이션을 써야 되는지 그럼 이제 무슨 일이 실제로 일어나는지 그런 것들 이제 알려드리려고 이제 얘기를 하는 겁니다. Right, so we can actually see a what really happen what really happens when you start you know, deforming your latent space right here. Question? Question from Park Jae-yong-nim. Activation function이 공간을 외격시켜 이후 linear classification이 가능, 가능해진다는 뜻인가요? 그렇죠. 그러니까 지금 지금 보시면은 지금 보시면 이제 여기 전에 여기 전에 이거 하기 전에 여기까지 지금 보시죠. 지금, 지금 로테이션 되고 있고 화, 공간이 지금 벌어지고 있잖아요. 공간이 벌어지고 있고 지금 이제 그 트랜슬레이션 하고 있죠. 지금 이제 그, 그 수평 수직이나 수평을 움직이고 있잖아요. 여기까지는 다 linear transformation입니다. 지금 이제 공간이 왜곡되고 있잖아요. 이것만 non-linear activation, non-linear transformation. 이거 지금 이거 공간 회전하고 벌어지고 그 격자가 벌어졌죠. 그다음에 격자가 움직이고 있죠. 격자 움직이고 있죠. 이건 전부 다 선형 변환이에요. 이제 그 선형 대수를 들어 그 선형 대수 들어셨던 그 기억을 되, 되, 되살리시면은 
그러니까 공간을 늘리는 것도 선형 변환이고 공간을 회전하는 것도 이제 사인 그 예를 들어서 2 x 2 매트릭스가 있을 때2 x 2 매트릭스가 이제 사인으로 코사인으로 가득 차 있으면 이제 이게 그 뭐죠 그 로테이션이 가능하잖아요 공간 로테이션 공간 로테이션 뭐 이런 것들 그럼 변뭐그 이 2x2 매트릭스가 뭐큰 값으로 가득 차 있으면 이제 변, 그 공간이 늘어나는 거고 2x2 매트릭스 공간 가, 작은 값으로 차 있으면은 뭐 0.몇 초차 있으면 공간 공간이 축소되는 거고 뭐 이런 식으로 이제 해석을 할 수가 있잖아요. 그래서 공간이 이제 회전하고 늘고 막뭐 선형으로 막 왼쪽 오른쪽 위아래로 움직이는 건다 선형 변환이고 마지막에 여기 아, 이제 나올 텐데 네, 여기서 이제 여기서 이제 이상하게 찌그러지잖아요 공간 이것만 비선형 변하는 거예요. 이거를 하려 이걸 해야지. 근데 이렇게 비선형 변환을 해야지. 얘네들이 이렇게 이상하게 짜부라지면서 이제 선형 분류가 가능해지는 거거든요. 그래서 이제 저게 굉장히 저거 없이는 이제 그 파워가 이 뉴럴 넷을 사용하는 게 의미가 없다. 이 논리니 액티베이션 펑션을 사용하지 않으면 의미가 없다. 그 얘기를 하는 거예요. 그래서 지금 보시면 이제 아마도 시그모이드 같은 걸 쓰면은 이런 식으로 이제 S자로 이렇게 꼬부러지겠죠. 이렇게 이렇게. 그래서 네. 박재형님 이제 말씀이 맞습니다. 네. 액티베이션 펑션을 이용해야지 공간이 왜곡되는 거고 그게 아니면 다 선형 변화예요. So what I'm what I just said in Korean is that before right up to this point where the uh, where the space is being warped like in an S shape, all this like space expansion, space rotation, space translation, they're all linear transformation of your two dimensional space. So only when you add a nonlinear activation function, then you you see the warping like this. And this warping is actually the source of power of neural networks because only through the warping can you do a linear classification and achieve 100% accuracy like this. Without warping, all you can do is just rotate, expand or compress your space or translate your space. And that is probably not enough to classify this kind of nonlinear, nonlinearly distributed data. So this makes it very clear. So uh, this is what's really happening with your uh, with the spiral example. We can start from we can see from the beginning. All right, starting from here, this is a linear old linear transformation, and now there's some deformation, another deformation, and compression, uh, expansion, nonlinear deformation. Trend, uh, th th there was a bit of a rotation, but still. So you can see at the last, no la at the very last moment, you could completely draw a linear line between the red group and the and the blue group. I mean, even already there could be you can draw a line here. You can draw a line here, and then to achieve a perfect accuracy. And you can see that this is not a this is not a neural network with one hidden layer. There's multiple deformation, translation, deformation, transformation going on. So you can see that this is a multi-layer perception with multiple hidden layers, but you can see what's going on inside the neural, inside the latent space. Basically, what we want to do is we want to achieve perfect accuracy, meaning minimizing the loss. And in order to do so, the latent space is following that step. All right. So you can see there's like a very, very heavy deformation of the original space, right? And uh, this is another example where the spiral is a bit more, um, it's like a worse scenario. You start from here and because it's so, they're so intertwined, there's not enough number of, there, you know, with some, with a series of you know deformation, transformation, and you know basically, if you no man, no matter how many layers, how many non nonlinear transformation layers you add to the space, you can't really. It's very hard for the model to completely disentangle the red group and the and the blue group because they're so intertwined from the beginning. So in this case, what we what needs to be done is any answer what. What can we do when the two groups are so inter intertwined or so entangled that we can't, you know, just by doing a transform linear transformation, nonlinear activation, we can't disentangle the two. We can't achieve 100% accuracy. In this case, what can we do? Is there any solution? Anybody uh, care, to, care to answer? Hey, it's bygone second now. 파란색이 너무 꼬여 있어가지고 지금 이제 아무리 공간을 찌그리고 뭐 이렇게 확장하고 해도 이게 안돼 지금 이제 선그선 하나를 그어서 100% 에큐러시를 
그 달성할 수가 없잖아요. 그럼 어떻게 해야 되냐? Answer, map them into higher dimension. Exactly, exactly. Very nice. 예, 유진님, 정, 정님, 전부 다 맞는 말씀입니다. So we can send them to a higher dimension. So that is where we can see a great example here. For example, if your data set looks like this, it's a concentric circle, and all the red ones are surrounded, completely surrounded by the blue ones. So no matter, in this case, no matter how you, how many times you deform your space, there's no way you can, you can draw a linear line and then classify them completely. This is virtually, this is just theoretically impl impossible, right? This is what's happening. With this kind of two-dimensional space, no matter how hard you deform, compress, or whatever, you're never going to be able to draw a linear line to classify them. So in this case, what can be done is we can actually map them into a higher dimensional space like this. Now, they live on 3D space instead of 2D. Then what you can do is simply you can just send one group to the downside and another group to the upside. So you can see the, the red ones are on the up and the blue ones are on the down. And their actual, you know, their, their, cord, their 2D coordinates did not change that much. You know, there's the red ones are still surrounded by the blue ones, but doesn't matter because now we are in the 3D space. You no, know, you can just draw a hyperplane right, be, be, right between this these two groups right here, right here. So in this case, that is why we need three dimensions. So, what you can what you can think of it, what, how you can interpret this is that here your model is underfitting. So what you need to do is whether when your model is underfitting, you you either increase the power or the capacity of your model, or you increase the feature. And here you can see that what we did is we increased the feature. Or actually, it's the same thing. If we if we add more feature or if we add more capacity to the model, they're actually the two are not more or less the same thing. So anyway, so we before we were, we were living in the two dimensional space, we use we were using two two features, but now we were in the three-dimensional space, so we're using three features. And now we can, do, we can see that it is no longer underfitting. It can do a perfect classification between the two. All right, so um, this is another, another example. So yeah, if you are interested in this, I can actually share the website, website address with you guys on the chat box. If you guys want to check it out, or actually they're also on the on the slides that I shared. All right, so let's move back to the slide. All right, any questions so far? No? All right, I think this actually is, with, if you just visit the webpage, you can understand what, you know, what, what neural network really is all about. It's basically learning just latent representation for performing, for, for conducting a test given to the model, and that's it. But, and the latent space will, I mean, obviously, the the shape and the correct the properties of the latent space will vary very differently depending on the architecture of your model. Whether if you use CNN or if you use RNN or if you use transformer, whatever, your latent space will look differently. But in the end, what you want to do is you want to either classify. If you want to do classification, what you want to do is in the end you want one group to be on one side and another group to be on the other side. If you want to do a regression, you want all the samples to be on a pre like a a, a Non, non increasing order, non decreasing, like a sorted order in the final latent space. And that's what you really want to do. All right. So, yeah, your latent space is shaped by your loss function, like I said many times. And doesn't matter what, what your task is. It could be man and woman classification, iris classification. This is a multi. So, this was a three way classifier. This is a two way class. This is two way classifier. This is regression. Regression. This word embedding is on so word embedding. What I'm here, what I'm talking about is word to vec, which actually we are going to learn anyway. So word to vec is unsupervised learning. So this will have its own own task. French English translation. This is sequence to sequence, seek to seek, seek to seek. 
And in the very beginning, in the very first introduction class, I, I said that one group being English sentences and another set being French sentences with infinite number of uh, elements in each set. And what you're doing is you're learning a translation function that maps one sentence to another sentence. And you can assume that your latent space will be filled with latent representation of all possible English sentences. Question, I heard about universal approximation theorem. Does it relate to the latent space? Uh, so universal approximation theorem is that with a neural network, so with a feed for a neural network with only one single hidden layer, you can, you can approximate any function that you can any any analytical function probably any not probability function but any analytical you can approximate any function with even with one hidden layer and that's not sure how that relates to uh, latent representation. So what your basically your neural network is a function, right? For example, here this the your the the purpose of the function is to map between one set, your domain being images, and your codomain being either one or zero. It's a binary space, right? It's one or zero. So it's a you're learning a mapping function between the two sets. If it's iris classification, it's one set being flower information, another set being one, two, three, like zero, one, two or actually three-dimensional space because we had three different types of flowers. So it's a mapping function between some larger space into a three-dimensional space. So it's always a function that maps between your input space and your output space. And universal approximation theorem guarantees that even with one single hidden layer with in the fit in the feed for network, which is a very, very simple network, you can, you can approximate any function you want. But that is just a theory in reality that never really works. You can't do translation with one hidden with a feed for a network of one hidden layer, right? You can't do image classification or image segmentation with one hidden layer. So that's just a theory. And uh, I, I'm not sure if it, if that has a direct correlation, direct relationship, relation with the latent space actually. Does that answer your question? So la latent space is what the function has learned in the intermediate layers so as to perform the final task. And uh, obviously, with universe, if you apply universal approximation theorem, you can perform any task or you can approximate any function with a feed for a network of one hidden layer. And that one hidden layer will be your will contain all the latent representations you, you, are, you want, right? Right. I'm going to I'm keep muting everybody. So unless you have a question, please yeah. keep yourself muted. So, who's in the morning? And the mic will cut you short, yeah. All right, I think we're good. All right, so the question, question answered. And today, since we're going to learn autoencoder, we're going to do this instead. So all these tasks and all these different latent spaces, latent spaces, latent spaces, latent spaces. But here, we're, today, we're going to learn the latent space formed by performing image compression because we're going to learn autoencoder. So moving on to autoencoder, we've already spent like 30 minutes on latent space, actually. So autoencoders, so here, what we do, what we have, as I said, autoencoder is very, very basic architecture. It has a symmetric structure where there's an encoder and there's a decoder. So there's an encoding process and decoding process. And the encoding process can be viewed as a compression process because this is 784 dimension. This is four dimension, four, and this is 784 dimension again. So what we're doing is we're first compressing the original image into four dimensional space. And then using a decoder, we are storing it back, we're expanding it back to the 784 dimension, the original space. And what we want to do is, we so the compression, the compression process is called, the process, pr compression process called encoding, and the de decompression process called decoding. And the way, the reason we say, we, we term them encode and decode is because sometimes 
very very like several like dozen like maybe 100 years ago like not not 100 maybe 80 years ago 70 years ago with all the communication theory and all that this was called code so if you think about like shannon's theorem and the you know, nystrom theorem all these if it's kind of like a communication theory um you, you, your signal is formed basically by compression, right? And your signal is sent to another party and they, they are called the code, like Morse code. So this, that borrowing, borrowing from that context, this is sometimes called code or latent variables or latent representation. And just, we call them Z actually, latent representation Z. Right here with Z. And as I said, oh, there's a question. 레이트 레프레젠테이션이 샘플보다 더 많은 디멘션을 가질 수 있는데 네, 당연히 그렇습니다. 그 얘기도 이제 할 거예요. 좋은 질문입니다. So the question is that can the latent space be larger than the original input the sample space? And that is the answer is yes. Although uh the what we can achieve with that is uh questionable, but we're going to talk about that. Very good question. So yeah, we're going to keep for now for now we're going to keep to keep with the uh, stick to the four dimensional uh, latent space example. So we start with 784, move to 4 and then revert back to a 784. And what happens is that there's an encoder that looks like this. There's a fun So this function is this this is not a denot denotation for function. This is nonlinear activation, nonlinear activation function, nonlinear activation function. This is another nonlinear activation function. They're not just a function on the activation. So this is, and so here, so here, this is a single neural network hidden layer, right? Neural network hidden layer, all it does is just linearly transform your input, linearly transform your input, add some bias, and then apply a nonlinear activation function. That, be, that, that you know, surmises your one, that, that corresponds to a single, hidden layer in your neural network, right? So there's one neural net, one hidden layer here, there's another hidden layer here. And if we want, what we want to do is we want to compress and decompress. So in order to do that, what needs to be, what needs to happen here? So this is 784, this is 784, 784, this is four dimensions. So your W1, the size of your W1 should be what? It should be, since X is being multiplied on the right side, it should be four by 784, matrix. 이제 4, 4 by 784짜리 그 행렬이어야겠죠. 그래야지 이제 x 784짜리 곱했을 때 이제 4짜리가 나올 거잖아. So so your uh your w1 should be a very like horizontally long long shaped matrix. And in the same manner, in the same same reasoning, your w2 should be the other way around. It should be a transpose of your w1. So this the shape of w2 should be 784 by four, by four, right? Because you're you're multiplying your z, which is four dimension, uh, onto this side. So if the z is being multiplied on on this side, so your four should be cancel canceling out, and you're left with seven eighty four, which is the original input space. All right. So that's how you construct your construct your uh, encoder and decoder. Right. So the encoding process is like this. Yeah. So you get you put x in and you get z out. But the decoding process, you get you put Z in, you get the reconstructed X out. And we call these call this reconstruction of, a, of an X, X prime. So X prime is our reconstructed example. And what should be the loss here? So what we want is in the autoencoder is that we want your we want our X and X prime to be as similar as possible, right? Because this is a compression and decompression. So the loss should be, in this case, we're going to use mean squared error loss. So all these, every single dimension of your X prime should be exactly the same as all the other same corresponding dimension of your X's, of your X, sorry, X. And yeah, so mean squared error. Hope, hope this makes sense, right? So pretty easy. So what you so this your x is given as an as a sample. There's no y here. This is not a this is not a supervised training. This is not a supervised learning test. This is an unsupervised learning. Test. All you need is just your sample, and there's no label, right? Your sample becomes a label. So your sample x is given from the data, and your x prime is what? Your x prime is derived from a combination or a combination combination of these two functions. These two functions. 
So x prime is so x prime is this, and z is this, and z is derived from your x. So that's basically it. So you can have uh, like this is analogous to what we've been what we've been doing so far with the cross entropy loss, but instead of using cross entropy loss, we're using squared error loss. And you train, and you can you you can obviously use more than just one hidden layer. Like uh, well, question from who was that? Right, question from Josh, Joshua Yu. No, sorry. Yeah, quite, yeah, kind of like relating to the question from Joshua, you can use multiple, multiple hidden layers before you go to the final latent representation. So in this case, you can, you can kind of interpret like this being another latent representation and this being another latent representation. But in generally, we only treat this final, you know, actual compressed, the most compressed space the space between the encoder and the decoder, we call that a latent representation here. So the, up, up, until the, up until Z, this is all encoding, encoding. And after Z, this is all decoding, right? And Z is our latent space. And you can add as many layers as you want. And it could be, you can actually construct your uh, autoencoder using RNN or CNN, transformer, whatever you want, actually. Right, moving on. So yeah, um, basically so far with four dimension, I, I repeated, repeatedly say that we're just compressing the information. So what we what what's happening here is that since we're moving from moving from seven eighty four to four dimension, we have it's inevitable that we have to lose some information, right? Not not I mean the inc the the whole architecture, the whole re whole autoencoder has to sacrifice some information and retain as, as much useful information here in the four dimensional space while removing or while you know, ignoring all the uninformative or kind of meaningless information in, in your image. For example, for example, if your image always consists of a person like this, maybe with a mustache, maybe with a mustache, maybe with, with a long hair, Maybe, maybe what? Maybe with a, like an earring, something like this. Basically, if your data set looks like this, then all these background here, the background, the background, background, they are kind of like meaningless information. You don't need to remember them in order to compress them because this all it's always the same. The background is always more or less the same. So you don't have to store them in this precious four-dimensional space. This four-dimensional space is left for the only very, very special information that distinguishes that distinguishes individual samples, right? Individual samples. If there are certain features or certain properties that are shared by all samples, then you don't need to waste your space on storing those samples because they can be re reconstructed by the decoder. The decoder can remember those kind of information. Like always, there's always a certain amount of background that is meaningless, then your decoder can can memorize that and then just mix that background information with the precious four-dimensional information to get back to the original space, right? So what's happening is that we need, so what's happening is we are learning some useful hidden features in the four-dimensional space because we've created an information bottleneck here. Only the most, only the most distinguishing, when I say meaningful, it means that distinguishing only the most distinguishing features across that that helps us distinguish between different samples. Those information, those types of features, are stored in the four-dimensional space. Or maybe those, the the late, more correctly, the feed, the latent space learns to capture those distinguishing features across different different samples. So, for example, if this guy has mustache, if this guy has this this person is a, a long hair, if this person is an earring, those kind of things are distinguishing. So they will be hit stored in this four-dimensional space. Does it make sense here? Right. So does it still consist of four axes, like long hair, mustache, ribbon? The, the same, so same example that I've been using so far. Uh, the answer, the question is, does the four in the four dimension created by or formed by the autoencoder, does it still have a very interpretable, interpretable meaning? To them, and the answer is probably not, because they're learned with a non-linear neural neural network. It's very hard to 
assume what they've actually picked up, what kind of signal they've picked up each dimension. So if you think about a PCA, there's a PCA, nice drawing of a PCA. So if you think about a PCA, starting, starting from the two dimension and then learning two principal components, let's assume that this is your, let's assume this is like, um, uh, not a binary feature, it should be. For example, let's say that you're, you're assuming a housing price. You're, you're regressing on the housing price, housing price. And your first feature is the size of your uh, size of your house. And the second is the ear of your house, right? So this could be your size. This could be the ear, ear built. Uh, second, yeah, the ear that the, your house was built in. Uh, so these two features, the two axes, are interpretable. We know that this first one is size, the second one is ear. But if you do a principal component uh, analysis and then get retrieve two principal components, then one component looks like this. One component looks like one component looks like looks like this. And another component looks like this. And then you're no longer able to really understand what this pr first principle, these two principal components are. This is a basically these two principal components are. The, if you look at the first one, this is a mix of some portion of size and some portion of ear, right? Like maybe eight, eight to two, 80, 20, 80, 20 mix. But still, I mean, so this no longer like directly interpretable. So this is, is the, already the P, with the PCA, which is actually a linear transformation. PCA is a linear function, right? So even with a linear function, linear transformation as PCA, it's already kind of hard to interpret what the learned principal components are. Needless to say, with a nonlinear transformation function like autoencoder, your learned components will be probably inter uninterpretable unless you unless you like add specialized specialized losses to disentangle the latent spaces to make them interpretable right so there's a couple of a uh, couple of bullet points for autoencoder now that i mean since we and then mention PCA, a bit of a comparison between the two. So PCA and autoencoder both have the same purpose, both serve the same purpose. PCA also minimizing the reconstruction error, but the way the PCA learns is to maximize variance, right? You try to, you do an SVD, singular value decomposition on your covariance matrix, and then you pick the most uh, high variance components, like top K, top K principal components to reduce the dimensionality of your input, basically compressing, right? And the way is do it is you do, the way you view PCA is you're maximizing the variance, but that, that is the same thing as actually minimizing the reconstruction error. Because as I said, if you want to reconstruct with the information bottleneck, which is basically compression, if you want to do that with the information bottleneck, you need to do away with all the low variance, all the low variance features, meaning that not, not so distinguishing features and only retain, only store, very distinguishing features, which is the high variance features, right? So these two are the same thing, autoencoder and PCA. But PCA is linear transformation, uh, autoencoder is nonlinear transformation. And the PCA, you saw a K variance maximizing basis. You, in autoencoder, you use K dims to compress. So here, PCA, you choose the number, of the, the value of K after you do PCA. But here in autoencoder, you predetermine, you predefine your K, which is your latent space size of the size of the latent space, right? You want it to be four, you want it to be eight, you want it to be sixteen. You have to define you have to define it before you train your autoencoder. So there's a bit of a difference between the two. And in autoencoder, and in, if you want to use higher dimensional space to, well, I, it wouldn't be a compressed because you're using high dimension. It would be like blowing up. But you in in autoencoder, you can easily blow up the size of dimensionality by just using higher dimensional space. You know, if your input space was 784, you can set your Z space to be 1000 and that's just, that's just it. But in PCA, in order to do that kind of stuff, you have to use kernel tricks. So you, can, you have to use like something called kernel PCA, that kind of stuff. So, right. So back to the point, a uh, question from Park uh, Sokbom. Question from Park Sokbom. You can use Z, which is Z, which has a, like a larger space than X, the original space. So in this case, what would happen? What you're trying to do is you are, you are using the X space and then you are blowing it up by some, some amount and then map them into Z space. So your, for your domain is 784 dimension, but in your, your latent space is Z is like 1000 dimension. So if you think about it, 
you can have a complete one-to-one -one correspondence, right? There is no compression going on. There is no information loss going on. There's nothing going on, actually. You can just completely, without losing any information, you can just go here and then here with perfect reconstruction, right? Do I have a solution here? No. So you can, if you're assuming that what you can, assuming that your neural network is very smart so you can learn a function that looks like this, like this much, this much can be, exactly, it could be an overfitting, but it's, yeah, it, it kind of is an overfitting. But what you're doing is what you can basically learn a identity matrix for this much. And then this much doesn't really matter. Whatever, whatever, whatever garbage we have doesn't really matter. And then this much, there's another identity function, and that's it. So if you can learn just identity function in both sides, then you can reconstruct without with zero information loss, like zero uh, loss. So why, I'm not sure why we why we would do this vanilla. There, there's a sparse autoencoder that actually uses a larger space, but that is only because we're we're sparsifying the latent space. So we're going to talk about that later. Question from Kim Dongsu on page 21. 21. 21. Why minimizing reconstruction error equals to maximizing variance? So um, as I said here, information bottleneck, information bottleneck, as I said here, in order, in order, so you have only four dimensional space to store the original, store the information from the 784. So you need to store only the very most precious information, most in, meaningful information in order to perfectly reconstruct, right? So as I said in this example, I said all the non-distinguishing features, like the background of a person's image, they are not stored in this precious four-dimensional space. And these four, these non-precious, non-meaningful background information is low variance information because these background information doesn't really change across different samples. Like this sample is background, this sample is background, this sample is background. So there's zero variance with this background property, right? So you don't store these background information into the into this four dimensional space because this is that would be a waste of waste of precious four dimensional channel it's a communication channel, right? So that is why I'm saying that minimizing the reconstruction loss is exactly the same as maximizing the variance between uh, across different samples, right? Hopefully that makes it clear. Right. So so far, autoencoder, we're all good. Uh, training process. Actually, I wanted to go talk about the de like technical details of training process, but we're running out of time, so I'm gonna like maybe just uh, speed things up a little bit because everybody already done gone, gone through the practice session number three. So they pre all, all you all of you guys probably have had some taste of what's what I'm about to explain here. So hopefully it's all very familiar already. So training neural training neural process. I mean, sorry, training process. And it's not just this. Just this not just applies to training autoencoder. Just applies to any training, any neural network architecture, any tra training, any neural network models. And it always consists of these six steps. One is splitting data into train valid test, and then loading the data, defining your model. So you, you should define your model architecture. It could be an autoencoder, it could be a CNN, it could be transform, whatever. You have to define a model. Also, along with your loss, because you want to do something with your model. It could be autoencoding, it could be translation, it could be image classification, whatever. Depending on what you want to do, you define your loss properly. It could be log likelihood, it could be um, MSC, it could be whatever. And then you have to define an optimizer. What kind of optimizing optimization algorithm you want to use in order to train your neural network? So far, we've only talked about stochastic gradient descent, which is like... Sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so far we've only talked about the stochastic gradient descent, which is the backbone of modern deep learning, right? But there are more advanced versions of advanced optimization algorithms like uh, AdaGred, Adam, uh, AdaGred, Ada Delta, Adam, Adam W. Uh, I think there is a couple more like very fancy ones these days. So you have to choose your optimizer and then you define your training loop and then you evaluate your best M. You during your training loop, you will get a lot of M1s, M2s, M3s, M4s, because you train over multiple times, right? So you get multiple models, updated, updated, and updated. And then among all those models, you choose the best one, probably mostly, most, most of the times based on your validation set. You choose the best one, and then you choose take that best one, and then evaluate on test set only once. So you never use your test set during training loop, right? So that is the old 
the major six steps of training on your, your neural networks. So if you look at them one by one, with a split, you usually, usually with, if you have like a, like a reasonable amount of data set, reasonable amount of sized data set, like maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000, or maybe a few thousands, you know, then you can split them into eight by one by one or six by two by two, depending on your task, you know. So if you have one thousand, if you have ten thousand samples in your data set, then it will there will be eight thousand training samples, one thousand validation samples, and one thousand test samples, right? And you can, you can if you have very small amount of data set, like maybe a few hundred, you might want to consider doing n fold cross validation, right? And then you can use something called scikit-learn function called train test split. You can go to sklearn uh, the website and then look for this specific function which sp which splits your data set into a train and test and given your given the ratio which is an argument or a parameter that you give to the function right with the test with the split then you need to load the data and if you have a man manageable amount of data you might want to store them into your memory and then start forming mini batches from your memory and then load them to your vram but if you have a really gigantic amount of data, they won't fit into your physical RAM, physical memory. Like in, in, in your workstation, your typical memory is like 512 gigabytes or one terabytes. And if your data set is larger than that, it won't fit into your memory. So you might want to stream from your hard disk or, or your SSD. So uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch, they all support the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, functionality, streaming from hard disk. So you can take a look at them. And if you want to, define your own data loader, you can do so by defining these two classes, data set and data loader. But typical ones like, you know, like MNIST or ImageNet or, you know, Cypher 10 or, um, or tr very simple translation data sets, they're all like somewhere in Hugging Face or PyTorch or SKLearn or wherever, they're usually there. So you're, you don't have to like define your own data loader, but if you have your very specific very special data set of your own, then you might want to define these two. Moving on. And yeah, then we then comes to defining the model. You can you can write your own model using any functionality, but usually people use torch.nn.module. They contain a lot of linear layers, uh, RNN layers, whatever layers you want to use, cross uh, uh, convolution that, and transformers. Actually, these days people, when you use transformers, people just call models from hugging face actually. But if you want to do, if you want to build something bottom up, then you might want to use a low level, low level functionality, low level APIs like this. And you define your loss, could be MSC, could be across entropy with some L2 regularization, L1 regularization. It's all on you. It's all on you choosing the right function. You can choose whatever loss function you want. And then once you do that, it's the time to define your optimization, optimization time to pick your optimization algorithm. As I said, there are a lot of variants. There's vanilla SGD, SGD with momentum, uh, Adagred, Atom, Atom X, Atom W. I think Atom W is also very popular these days. And they're all under this family, torch.optim.star. So you can look them up in your in this in this path. I think Atom W or Atom is like the one that people uh, use a lot to this day. And then there's training loop and evaluation. So these two are a bit more, a bit more, uh, takes more time. So let's just go one at a time. So training loop usually goes like this. So there's one, there's a, it's a nested loop. It's a nested for loop. The outer loop is for iterating over epochs and the inner loop is iterating over batches. So epoch is a one epoch. One epoch is when you go over the entire training sample. For example, if your training set consists of 10,000 samples and you typically do a mini batch optimization, right? So mini, let's assume that your mini batch size is, so your, let me erase that. Your, your size, of, size of your training sample is 10,000 and your size of your mini batch, mini batch is, let's assume that is 100. Then you are going to take 100 iterations, 100 repeat repetition in this, in like 100 times 100 in order to go one epoch. So one epoch, one epoch equals, one epoch, equals 100 mini batch iterations in this specific example in this specific example right so you do it for multiple number of epochs you know uh, so it could be 10 epochs 20 epochs 100 epochs it actually depends on your task so there's repetition for any epochs repetition for k batches 
inside this inner loop, inside this inner loop of over the over the mini batches, first you fetch a random mini batch. It has to be a random mini batch. Your mini batch, whether it's size 100, whether it's size 64, 120, doesn't really matter. Your mini batch needs to consist of randomly sampled, randomly sampled examples. And there should be no dependency across different mini batches as well. Your mini batch should always be sampled randomly. So, so as to so as to observe or abide by the IID principle of your SGD algorithm. So SGD, stochastic gradient descent, will only work as long as meet working, meaning that stochastic gradient descent will only be the, asymptotically the same as full gradient descent as long as your mini batches are sampled IID. If not, then it's not going to work, theoretically. Sometimes it works, but th theoretically, what people have proved is that in order for your SGD to work asymptotically, the same way as GD, a gradient descent, your mini batch sample must be sampled randomly. So keep that in mind. That in mind. And then iterating, iter iterating th through your mini batches, you push your X through your model M, and then you obtain your Y prime, which is the predicted, predicted outcome. Then you use your loss function, Y prime and Y, and then calculate the loss. And then you use your optimizer, optimizer whatever you chose, atom, eta grad, NMW, whatever, you use your up, use, use your optimizer to update your M's parameter, your model parameter. So that is one for one for loop for your inner loop. And then after you've done this so, so several times, maybe after one epoch, you might want to evaluate your model. After one epoch, after every epoch, you might want to evaluate your model on your validation set. So and after you validate, if your validation performance is the best yet so far, if it's the best one so far then you want to save that model because it's the best one so far. And you want to keep them around until the end of your number of epochs. And then you want to use that best model, best validation model for testing purposes. Right. So you can actually, so here this in this example, we are, we are evaluating the validation performance once every epoch, but you can actually do it more frequently or less frequently. You can do like, every 5k batches or every 10k batches or you know it depends on you or every two epochs or every three epochs depends on your preference whether you want to uh, evaluate your evaluate your model's validation performance more often or less often it's up to you but in this case we're doing it every once once every epoch right so actually yeah, i'm going to move on so these these are just uh, some Porch specific examples. Hope, uh, hopefully, everybody already is a bit familiar from the practice session number three. So, re fetching random random mini batches, you can you you uh, you can do it from using the data loader. So you should can you oh there is no example here. Okay, so you can do it from the data loader, and then you push it through. You push your x's through your model m, and you get y prime, and then uh, the the con the cost function the I'm sorry, sorry. The loss, the loss function, the loss value. You might want to print them out you know, from time to time to see if your model is actually training or not. So, actually, these days people use a lot of visualization tools like TensorFlow tools or like a one DB type kind of tools. And when you print out your losses, then you can see whether the loss is decreasing or not. And if it's if it's decreasing, then your model is learning something. If it's not decreasing, then something is very wrong with your setup. And then when updating with your optimizer, you have to always call zero grad first. So you so as to flush out all the gradients from the previous iteration. So you call the zero grad, and then starting from your C, starting from your C, which is your loss loss value. Starting from C, you do a back propagation all the way to the input layer, and then you take a step that which actually updates your model parameters. Right, and uh, that's it. So evaluation evaluation is evaluation. There's there's also a loop for evaluation because your evaluation set your validation set might be also too large to fit into a single batch. You know if it's if your minute, if your training size is ten thousand, if your validation size is one thousand, and if your batch size is one hundred, then you still need to go 10, 10 batches to go over the entire validation set, right? So it's, there's still like a loop involved with the validation uh, evaluating validation performance. So here you fetch the mini batch. Here you don't need to actually do random random. You you don't need to sample mini batches for validations at random because you don't you're not learning anything. You're not updating your parameters or anything. You're just doing an inference. So you can just you know you, you can just uh, call call the mini batch sequentially or whatever you want, and then do the same thing. Push x through your model and then you obtain y y prime and then you 
calculate you calculate the performance you calculate the performance and then actually well here what we're what we're what i'm trying to say here is that you save the batch performance for for a single mini batch you should have some validation performance like some loss or some accuracy some aurc score some au prc score some f1 score whatever score you have for your batch you save them and then you save for every batch and then you average them and that would that would become your validation performance so that is why, that is why i'm saying here you need to save the batch performance so whatever performance metric you have you want to average across the entire validation set so keep that in mind and so and so cal finally calculate the validation performance right here if your validation performance is the best one so far that you want to save them and the way to save them is you can actually just copy them and then say have them around in your vram by doing simply doing this or you can actually save them in your local hard drive using this command here if you want to save a lot of, of uh, save many models like many different versions of model you might you probably want to save them in your local hard, hard drive Right, and then evaluating your best model on test set. This is the last step. So here, you want to load your best M that was saved here, saved here. You want to load your best M and evaluate your best M on the test set and then calculate test performance this is. So there's also a bit of a loop involved. So before that, we load the load your model using this, using these commands from the PyTorch. So load state dict from your saved variable or from your hard disk drive, hard, hard drive path. You, Anyway, you have to load them, and then you repeat the t batches of test sets. So there's also in, like a for loop involved. So you do the same thing as a validation set. You save, you put, you you sample your, you don't sample. You you take a mini batch, and then you push it through your model, and then you get your performance, and then you save your performance for the next batch, next batch, and then you across all batches you average your test performance, and you get the final performance, right? So that test performance should be measured only once with your best model. So far, so good, right? So hopefully this all kind of like familiar with everybody. I mean, you're gonna go, you're going to go through this anyway this Thursday with the autoencoder example. So you'll get a chance to get familiarized with this uh, process, and you're gonna reuse this entire entire like you know procedural step. No matter what model you're using, no matter what task you're doing, no matter what kind of you know, neural network architecture you're using, doesn't really matter. It's always more or more or less the same this this uh, process all right moving on to the visualization so what what are, what are we visualizing what we're visualizing is we're trying to visualize the latent space learned by the auto encoding auto encoding model so here for example let's say that you're you're minimize you're compressing your mnist digit images like one one five and what we can assume is that when ones are when, when these samples are compressed to the four dimensional space samples that were that looked similar in the original space should still look similar in the latent space for example one the first one is compressed like this second one is compressed like this and the third five is compressed like this and we want we probably are pretty sure that these two this pair should be a more or less you know have the similar values compared to this pair like you know like 0 0.5 0 0.9 negative 2 negative 2 negative 1 0.8, negative 2.6, 2. 1. 1. 1.7, 1. 1.7, 1.9. Like these two are like pretty similar compared to how dissimilar these two are, right? So this is very predictable. This is actually expected outcome. We want the we want samples that were similar in the original space still be similar in the latent space. So we can assume some kind of like a latent space that behaves like this. So we can draw a four-dimensional latent space into well, actually, this is two-dimensional space. We're we're doing a scatter plot. So assume that, for example, let's say that we compress the original image into a two-dimensional space instead of four. If we compress them into two-dimensional space, then we can take just take those two-dimensional compressed values as x and y coordinates, and then just scatter plot them, and that's it. So this is actually this picture is actually borrowed from the material from what we're going to do this Thursday. So this is a real example with mnist compression so you can see that they're already already kind of like you know forming a pretty neat neat uh, distribution so the ones are packed together and then sixes and threes again threes twos i mean there are some nicks up here like four five seven four they're like all jumbled together here but at least here ones are 
pretty on, on one side, right? So we would like to see kind of, once we've done a autoencoding uh, training and then we've had, we have our latent space, we might want to visualize what the latent space looks like. And this is a way to do it. But the problem is that uh, what we did here is that we compressed our images into four dimensional space, not two, right? In order to do a scatter plot in 2D plane, you need to further downsize the dimensionality from four to two, right? And this applies to any autoencoder. For example, let's say that you compress your latent space, you compress your original space into maybe 10, 10 dimensional space, or maybe 20, maybe 64, maybe 128, doesn't really matter. Whatever, what I'm trying to say is that we, we, when you want to visualize your latent space by 2D scatter plotting, you need one more dimensional reduction into two dimensional space. So the way to do it is you can use, so yeah, we need an additional dimensional reduction from DIMSY, which is which was four in our case, but could be anything from DIMSY to two so that we can plot on 2D plane. So there are popular three algorithms, PCA, TSNA, UMAP. So PCA, we know, right? TSNA, hopefully already a lot of people know. UMAP is kind of a, like a more advanced version of TSNA. These are all popular algorithms that you use for visualizing visualization purposes. So uh, once you have DIMZ, once you have a compressed representation of your late, compressed representation of your input samples, you need to further downsize them into two dimensions. And you can, when you use PCA, you're basically doing a variance-based you know, compression. And you can easily call them in scikit. You can easily call PCA and then downsize your latent space into two dimensional space. And then you can do scatter plot using matplotlib or that kind of stuff. TSNE is a bit different from PCA. So, first of all, PCA is a linear transformation. PCA, if I remember correctly, is a nonlinear non -linear, uh, transformation. And the purpose is a bit different. So, TS what TSNE does is that TSNE tries to uh, preserve the local distance between local distance between the samples. So if a certain sample was, if two, if a pair of samples was close, was close to each other in terms of L2 distance, close to each other, close to each other in the original space, then TSNE still wants those pairs, those pair, that pair to be still close to each other in the latent space, in the compressed space. So that local distance is still preserved. And TSNE doesn't really care about how far, so like, so for example, if a certain sample was, I can't draw a 3D space actually. Like if two samples was very close to each other in the original space and then you do TSNE into the two, into two dimensional space, they should still be close to each other. But if some, if this, for example, if this, this sample and this sample, they're very far from each other, then TSNE doesn't really guarantee that they will still be far or they'll be close or farther, doesn't really, they don't, there's no really guarantee. TCN only cares about the local structure, local, local distances between the samples. But still, it looks pretty, it looks nicer than PCA because it kind of preserves the local distances. UMAP is a, a bit more advanced than TCN. So TCN only cares about the local distance, but UMAP cares about the global structure a bit. So you, need, you have a hyperparameter, like how much you want to preserve the global structure. So you need to play around with the hyperparameter, but still it looks nicer than TCN. In some in some aspect, so uh, TSNE is also in scikit-learn, but UMAP unfortunately is not on scikit-learn. I looked it up yesterday; it's still not on scikit-learn. So you have to go to GitHub and then download it and then install. So here there's a repository for UMAP where you can download it and then install it, and then you can perform U UMAP visualization. So if you actually go there. Um, Give me just a second. I can actually show you guys what it looks like. Oops. Right. Okay, I need to reshare my screen. Right. So this is a comparison between TSNE and UMAP. And they're what they're doing is they're doing a clustering of fashion analysts. So in fact, fashion analyst is like 
digit MNIST, but instead of having numbers, it has different uh, clothings, clothes, like t-shirt, shirt, pullover, coat, dress, sandal, sneaker, ankle boot, trouser, bag. And you can see that here, these are like, I'm not sure, this is like shirts, these are pants, and uh, there, there are sandals and, and shoes, right? So compared to Tisney, which is, for example, here, here, samples from different classes, like different types of clothing are all mixed up together here and here. And even with the sandals here, like there's sandals and there's like shoes and there's ankle boot and they're like, I mean, samples that are from the class, same samples that are from the same class, like all ankle boots, I mean, all sandals are in the same, in the vicinity. They're all in the neighborhood. And all the uh, shoes, all the uh, sneakers, yeah, sneakers are, sneakers are also in the neighborhood. But but the two are also kind of similar, kind of like close to each other. The, the, the sneaker group and the sandal group are close to each other. But if you look at, um, and also, which is not probably desirable, but the, Sandal group and the pants group are also not too far from each other. So that is why that is what, where we can see that teasing doesn't really preserve the global structure because it might be a nice idea to have the sandals and the sneakers among like close to each other because they're all footwear. But ha having footwear with pants close to each other, like like the purple ones and the and the, the cyan ones, is probably not a good idea. And um, me too. Need to uh, zoom out, right? But with UMAP, you can actually see that's not the case. In UMAP, UMAP, the footwear, the footwear here are all all like in jumbled together, and the pants are all over each other, like they're all way over here. So they're no longer they're no longer in the vicinity, like in the TSNI. So they're very much clear. There's a clear distinction between similar groups and this and the clear. I mean, sorry. Very clear distinction between di dissimilar groups and clear jump like clustering effect with the similar groups. So it's uh, looks more nicer than TSNI. So probably a good idea to try out UMAP if you want to get a nicer visualization compared to TSNI. All right, hope that makes sense. And uh, moving on. Right, so that was visualization so far, and we're only left with autoencoder variants. So I'm just going to go very quickly over them. So sparse autoencoder, there are two variants, two very famous popular variants of autoencoder. One is sparse autoencoder, and another is denoising autoencoder. And sparse autoencoder, as I said, you use a larger, larger latent space, but what you want to do is you want to have them sparse, so a lot of them being zero values here, 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 and only a very small number of dimensions being non-zero. So very low activation value. And the reason we are doing this is because we want, if you do like sparse autoencoding, it is kind of better for downstream tasks. For example, when you want to use a latent space, learned latent representation for classification purposes or that kind of stuff, it, it is said that they perform better than vanilla autoencoder. And you can see them, why? Because it kind of acts like a drop, like a dropout in neural network. So... Inducing sparsity is kind of like a regularization, if you think about L1 regularization. So the way you do it is you have a typical loss function, reconstruction loss function, added with a sparsity-inducing term, sparsity-inducing term with uh, omega. And there are two, two, two variants of sparsity autoencoding term. One is using KL divergence. So you have a empirical... Bernoulli distribution of your individual individual uh, dimensions. So how often they're activated. So that's your empirical, and this is your desired Bernoulli distribution. Ber Bernoulli distribution mean. So if you want, if you set your row to be like 0 0.01, it means that you want your first dimension to be active one out of hundred times. If you set your row to be 0 .0 0 0.1, then it means that you want your corresponding corresponding dimension to be active one out of 10 times, something like that. So it's kind of like adjusting or controlling the, uh, the active activity of each dimensionality. So you can use KL divergence to do that, or you can use L1 regularization actually, which is a bit more straightforward. So with uh, 
with all the activation activated values, you have a absolute value and then you sum them up, then that you want to penalize them. So if you think about L2 regularization and L1 regularization, there's a bit of a difference. So if you're familiar with a la like rich, last, uh, rich regression and lasso regression, uh, L1 regularization induces sparsity as opposed to L2 regularization. So, um, I don't, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to go a bit quickly into how they're different. So if you think about L1 regularization with the, with the absolute term, they lo it looks like this. And uh, L2 regularization would look like this, right? Like this. Well, I mean, it's not a pretty drawing because the area between area here should be the same. So what I'm trying to say is that with L L1 regularization, when, I mean, sorry, with, with L2 regularization, as your loss comes comes down to as, as your loss decreases at some point your gradient or i'm sorry as your loss comes down to yeah your your as loss decreases to some amount your the gradient will will become zero right and then with so, so here the gradient is steep not so steep not so steep and then it's almost the same it's almost zero right so as you go towards zero with l2 regularization your error signal will diminish quadratically so at certain point, it's no longer update your parameters, but with L1 regularization, L1, there's there's always the same same gradient, which is one, right? So up up, to, up until the very end, up until your your model are your error is completely zero, it'll always have a constant gradient. So at certain point, which is the, the certain point being here, which is where your L1 regularization has a higher penalization compared to L2 regularization, because your L2 uh, the the loss error error decreases quadratically. So at certain point, your L1 L1 regularization, L1 regularization will have a higher penalization compared to L2, and that is why it induces sparsity. So you can use this as you can use either KL or you can use L1 regularization in order to induce sparsity here in the latent space. Moving on, there's the second variant is called auto uh, denoising autoencoder, where you exactly Noise, put noise on top of your x's. So your x being your actual original input, you put some noise on top of it, usually Gaussian noise. So you, there's a corruption process. And then given this corrupted input, you do an autoencoding. So this is kind of like, if you think, if you're familiar with BERT, BERT is kind of like this. BERT, kinda, BERT is like removing certain part, part of the sentence, removing some, some number of words from your sentence and trying to reconstruct. This is instead of removing, putting some noise on top of it. So, uh, yeah, so the, uh, the small, the gist or the philosophy of denoising autoencoder is that small, small noise doesn't affect the high level of representation. For example, if you put some, some amount of noise here into the uh, original input like this, we can kind of still see that it's a digit two, right? Small noise doesn't really affect the, the, the core semantic, the core meaning of your image. And that should remind you of something, which hopefully, everybody already knows the answer to is PCA, PCA. Because in PCA, what you're doing is you're only getting the highest varying variation inducing bases and you're removing, and you're just ignoring all the small noises or small, small variances among, among different samples. So you're only choosing the high variance bases and kind of like this, kind of like the old tying together. If you add some noise, it doesn't really matter because it's, it's ignorable by your information bottleneck. So right, autoencoder must learn useful patterns to perform denoising. So it, it, needs to, it needs to really focus on the, on the essence or the core meaning of your sample. And the important thing is the loss function is not this. You don't, do, you don't compare reconstruction loss between x and x prime. Obviously, naturally, it should be between your corrupted input and x prime. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, uh, I, can, I, can, I described it in another way. Loss function is between this, not not this. So between here and here, not here and here, because you're you're trying to denoise it. So if you start from here and then try to reconstruct it here, then it's not it's not per serving the purposes. You're actually you want to construct you want to do a loss function between your actual uncorrupted sample with reconstructed sample, so that your z space will learn a very robust latent representation. They can denoise. They can denoise your no corrupted samples. And as I said, the corruption is done usually by Gaussian noise, but it could be some other noise. It doesn't really matter though. 
And if you do this denoising autoencoder, then your latent space Z will be a very will be very robust to small variances in the test distribution. So it can be it's very not very, but it's kind of useful for doing downstream tests like classification or regression based on the learned representation from here. So in the very early deep learning era, like 2012 or 20, actually not even 2012, like 20, denoising autoencoder was proposed back in 20, not 20, 2008 or 2009, something like that by uh, Yusha Benjo's group, if I can remember correctly. So very back then, like 2008 or nine, and people used stacked denoising autoencoder to, re to, to learn, a representa learn a hidden representation of some images or MNIST images or cipher tens and that kind of stuff, and then do classification on top of it. So it was not end-to-end -end training. You just trained layer by layer denoising autoencoder, like there's denoising autoencoder all the way up. So it's like trained layer-wise, 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 and then you get the final representation. And then you take that representation, do a, like a 10-way classifier for cipher 10 or MNIST image. So that was very back way back in 2008, nine, and then 2012 came in with Alex. So it's very old, old, old architecture, old, like old uh, concept, but denoising autoencoder is still kind of like, you can see from time to time in the literature. And the, this is still used in like augmentation. You, when you do a like SimClear type of thing or BO type of like self-supervised learning for your image, image classifier or image encoder, you do some heavy augmentation with rotation and noising, denoisation. I mean, putting noise on top of it, and solarization, cropping, and that kind of stuff. They're all like, you know, in the same, they are using the same philosophy as this. You're trying to make your model robust to small, small noises or small variances. All right, so I think we're done for today. Uh, any question before we end? So we've done with autoencoder. So hopefully everybody knows what autoencoder is and the latent space, what the late learned latent spaces is all about latent representation being useful or not useful depending on your performance and depending on your task. Hopefully everybody understands so that we can move on to variational autoencoder next week. All right, I'm gonna wait for maybe five seconds before we end. All right, no question. All right. Anyway, if you have questions, always post them on Classroom and hope you I'll see you guys next Tuesday. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yeah, 감사합니다. 감사합니다. Yeah, 감사합니다.